Thank you, Stan, for those marvelous comments. I also want to thank the Nobel Assembly for honoring me in this marvelous way and for giving me the opportunity to share this honor with Paul and with Arvid, whose work I enormously admire. Uh, I've been told that the opportunity of giving a Nobel lecture is one of the high points of the visit to Stockholm as part of the Nobel Prize. But I must say, seeing people hang out over the balconies is something that even I was not prepared for. This is really just a marvelous moment for me. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? As the title of my talk, which then introduced you to, indicates, the aim of my research over the years has been to develop a reductionist approach to learning and memory that would allow me to explore the underlying mechanisms in molecular terms. Learning, as you well know, is the process by which we acquire new knowledge about the world, and memory is the process by which we retain that knowledge over time. For me, learning and memory have proven to be endlessly fascinating mental processes because they address one of the most remarkable aspects of human behavior, our ability to acquire new ideas from experience. Most of the ideas we have about the world and our civilizations we have learned, so that in good measure we are who we are because of what we've learned and what we remember. Conversely, many psychological and emotional problems are thought to result, at least in part, from experience. And specific disorders of learning and disturbances of memory haunt the developing infant as well as the mature adult. Down syndrome, the normal weakening of memory with age, and the devastation of Alzheimer's disease are only the more familiar examples of a large number of diseases that affect memory. For a biologist interested in the mind, the study of learning has the further appeal that unlike thought, language, and consciousness, learning is the mental process that is most accessible to a molecular analysis. Elementary forms of learning and memory have been well characterized by classical psychology since the first half of the 20th century, and they represent the most clearly delineated and for the experiment the most easily controlled of any mental process. I initially became interested in the study of memory while an undergraduate at Harvard College in 1950, motivated by a long-standing interest in psychoanalysis. But as I became immersed in biology doing medical training, I began to find the psychoanalytic approach limiting because it tended to treat the brain, the organ that generates behavior, as a black box. In the mid-1950s, while in medical school, I began to appreciate that during my generation, the black box of the brain would in fact be opened and gradually demystified. I realized that the problems of memory storage, once the exclusive concern of psychologists and psychoanalysts, could become approachable with the methods of modern biology. As a result, my interest in memory shifted from a psychoanalytic to a biological approach. I spent three years, 1957 to 1960, as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, learning more about the biology of the brain. I had the vague hope that with time, I might contribute to translating some of the central unresolved questions in the psychology of learning and memory into the empirical language of biology. I was interested in knowing what sort of changes does learning produce in the neural networks of the brain? How is memory initially stored? And once stored, how is memory maintained? What are the molecular steps whereby a transient short-term memory is converted into an enduring, self-maintained long-term memory. My purpose in attempting this translation was not to replace psychological or psychoanalytic thinking with the logic of molecular biology, but to contribute to a new synthesis that would do justice to the interplay between the mentalistic psychology of memory storage and the molecular biology of signaling. With time, I developed the further hope that the biological analysis of memory mechanisms might in themselves reveal new aspects of neuronal signaling. Indeed, this has proven to be true. Time and again, the study of memory has exposed us to important new aspects of biological phenomena. At first thought, somebody interested in learning and memory might be tempted to tackle the problem in its most complex and interesting form. This was the orientation that my colleague Alden Spencer and I originally had in 1958. When at the start of our scientific careers, we joined forces at the NIH 
to study the cellular properties of the hippocampus, the part of the mammalian brain thought to be most directly involved in complex aspects of memory. Despite the good start we were able to make in the cellular analysis of hippocampal neurons, it, seemed to, it soon became clear to us that to understand how the cells of the hippocampus participate in organismic behavior was a formidable challenge. Because the mammalian brain has a large number of neurons, an immense variety of interconnections, it seemed unlikely that one could work out how sensory information about learning reached the hippocampus and how learned information processed by the hippocampus might influence behavioral motor output. I therefore became convinced that if one were to bring the power of modern biology to bear on the study of learning, it would be necessary to take a very different approach, a radically reductionist approach. One needed to study not the most complex case, but the simplest case of memory storage, and to study them in the simplest and technically most tractable systems available. One needed to develop experimental systems in which a simple behavioral act that was modifiable by learning was controlled by a small number of large and accessible nerve cells so that one could relate the animal's overt behavior to molecular events that occurred in nerve cells that control the behavior. Such a reductionist approach based upon the selection of technically congenial systems is traditional within biology. But when it came to mental processes such as learning and memory, many investigators were reluctant to consider a reductionist approach. However, from the outset, I believe that a mechanism of memory storage will likely to be evolutionary conserved and that a molecular analysis of learning, no matter how simple the animal of the task, was likely to reveal mechanisms that would be of general relevance. And so after an extensive search, I focused in on the Plesia californica, which you can tell at a moment's glance is not only a very beautiful animal, <laughs> but exactly the sort of animal that you would select for the study of learning and memory. <laughs> for the structural biologist, I should simply point out that this is the head of the animal and this is the tail of the animal. <laughs> this animal is not only very beautiful, but it is highly intelligent <laughs> and exceedingly accomplished. Now, the remarkable thing about its accomplishments is that it has done this with a rather simple nervous system. Your brain consists of 10 to the 12 neurons, a million, million cells. By contrast, the, plane of, uh, the brain of a pussy contains about 20,000 nerve cells. These are clustered in, in groups called ganglia, each containing about 2,000 nerve cells. A single ganglion, like the abdominal ganglion I'm going to tell you about, controls not one behavior, but a set of behaviors. So the number of cells committed to simple behavioral acts can be quite small, 100 even less. I will also point out to you later that not only are there few cells, but they're really gigantic. So given the fact that one has a tractable nervous system, how does one go about then thinking about developing a cell and molecular biological approach? Now it was clear from the beginning, and these are discussions I had with Alden Spencer and Irving Kupferman, that one needed to meet a number of criteria in order to develop an intellectually satisfying approach to learning and memory. And four criteria are particularly important. One is one needed to delineate a behavior in this simple organism that could be modified by learning. One needed to do extensive behavioral analysis. Two of them, one needed to define in cellular detail the neural circuit that mediated the behavior that was being modified by learning. Third, one needed to locate within that neural circuit the critical size that were modified by learning. And having then located it, one could bring the tools of modern cell and molecular biology to bear upon the analysis of the mechanisms that mediated the learning and that stored the memory. So I'm going to follow this outline. And let me begin with the delineation of the behavior. So this is a plesia. We used this simple animal and continued with the reductionist approach, selecting the simplest behavior that the simple animal could generate. So the animal has a respiratory organ called the gill, which is normally covered by a sheet of skin called the mantle shelf, which ends in a fleshy spout called the siphon. If you apply a weak tactile stimulus to the siphon, you get a brisk withdrawal of the gill. This simple defensive reflex is like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. 
And the surprising thing we found from the very beginning is this elementary behavior in this elementary organism can be modified by a number of different learning processes. It can be modified by habituation, by sensitization, and by classical conditioning. And what was even more interesting was the fact that not only could it be modified, but the modifications resembled more complex forms of learning in more complicated organisms, which I will tell you about later on. For example, with each of these forms of learning, there was a short-term memory that lasted minutes and a long-term memory that lasted days, weeks, or even longer, number one. Number two, in each of these cases, practice made perfect. You transferred from short-term to long-term information by repetition. And three, in each of these cases, long-term memory differed fundamentally from short-term memory in requiring the synthesis of new proteins, something which had been characterized for complex forms of learning in mammals. This made one think at the very beginning that if one could define some of the proteins that are critically involved in the switch from short-term to long-term for any form of learning, one might be defining proteins that are of general importance. So with this idea in mind, we focused on one particular form of learning called sensitization, which I will now describe to you. Sensitization is a form of learned fear in which the animal learns about the properties of an aversive stimulus. So if you give a noxious stimulus to the animal's tail, it recognizes the stimulus as being unpleasant, as being aversive, and it learns to enhance its reflex responses. So if you previously gave a weak tactile stimulus that produced a modest withdrawal, now give a noxious stimulus to the tail, the same weak tactile stimulus will produce a more powerful withdrawal. And the animal will remember this aversive event as a function of number of repetitions. If you give it a single training trial, it will remember it for minutes, and this does not require new protein synthesis. If you give five training trials, it'll remember it for days, and this requires new protein synthesis. If you give further training, it'll remember it for weeks, and this, of course, also requires protein synthesis. I want to focus on the difference between one training trial, a short-term memory, and five training trials, minimum long-term memory that requires new protein synthesis, to look at the relationship between them. So the next thing we want to do is sort of delineate the neural circuit for this behavior. And our initial step was to show that the abdominal ganglion was the critical mediator of the behavior. Now, the abdominal ganglion, which I show illustrate here, shares features with other uh, ganglion aplysia. And the most remarkable feature is that the neurons are not simply large, they're gigantic. A cell like R2 is a millimeter in diameter. Prior to my presbyopic days, I could recognize it with my naked eye. <laughs> Some of you might still be able to do it. These cells are, of course, large enough, and Jimmy Schwartz was the first one to show this, that they can be dissected out by hand. You could develop biochemical approaches to transmitter biochemistry in single cells. You could generate cDNA libraries from single cells, as Richard Axel was to uh, do later on. You could do all kinds of molecular manipulations that are difficult to do in other animals. We soon recognized that not only were the cells gigantic, the largest cells in the animal kingdom, nerve cells in the animal kingdom, but they're also characteristic in their pigmentation and in their location, so we could recognize them as unique individuals, and we could give them names like Paul and Manouche, but I was not creative enough to use those names. We used prosaic names like R2 and L2, but one could identify many cells in the ganglion, in fact, in the whole nervous system, as being absolutely unique. Moreover, after a while, we realized that we could not only realize that these cells were unique and return to the same cell in every animal of the species, both naive and trained, but we also realized that we could map connections between cells, and after a while, we could map connections between cells and the sensory and motor periphery. So, for example, if you stimulated one of the six cells that we identified to be motor neurons to the gill, just stimulating a single cell by itself produced a detectable movement of the gill. We can then identify sensory neurons that innovated the siphon skin, and when we stimulated them with a single action potential, they produced a nice, fast, juicy synaptic uh, potential, glutamate mediated, of the kind that Paul spoke about, in the motor neurons. So if you now stimulated a sensory neuron repetitively as occurred in the behavior, it would fire the motor neurons and it would cause a gill contraction. So not only could we work out a neural circuit in terms of specific identified cells, but these identified cells had significant controls over behavior. And that's because there was such a limited number of cells involved. 
And in this way, we're able to work out the neural circuit of the behavior, which I indicate here in very simplified terms. So if you stimulate the siphon skin, you activate 24 sensory neurons that make direct connections to motor neurons. And the motor neurons, the six motor neurons, make direct con connections to the gill. The sensory neurons also excite inhibitory and excitatory interneurons that modulate the firing of the motor neurons. So the first thing that struck Vincent Castellucci and Irv Kupfer and myself as we looked at this neural circuit was its invariance. Not only were the cells invariant, but the connections were invariant. Certain cells only connected to some cells and not to others. And this, of course, posed the first interesting question in the study of learning and memory. How do you reconcile the invariance of the connections, in fact, the high specificity that one sees in the brain in general with the modifiability of behavior. And Carl Lashley and many people had worried about this. In fact, Cajal had first posed the problem at the beginning of the century. And by the time we came along, there were really a lot of confused thinking going on about the mechanisms of memory storage. For example, Carl Lashley had suggested, along the lines that Paul Greengard had earlier developed, that there were electrical fields that were generated by learning that somehow modified behavior. So we thought we'd just explore it empirically. We would produce learning and see what happens. And so we, when we looked at various forms of learning, examining the uh, neural circuit of the reflex, we found that in every case, what learning did was alter the strength of pre-existing synaptic connections in the brain. In some forms of learning, this was enhanced. In other forms of learning, this was, uh, uh, the synaptic connections were decreased in strength. Moreover, we found that the, the persistence of the change, of the synaptic change, was the mechanism whereby memory was stored. And I, show this as an example using sensitization, but as a general principle, this is held up for almost every form of learning that has been explored in any detail. So genetic and developmental processes give you the precision of interconnections between nerve cells. What they do not specify, what they do not give you, is the exact strength of connections. What learning does is to alter the strength of these connections. Let me illustrate what happens with the case of sensitization. If you stimulate the tail, you activate three different modulatory systems in the brain, very much like the modulatory systems in the base of your brain that you heard about from Ovid Carlson. The serotonergic pathway is particularly important. This pathway ends on the sensory neurons, including on the presynaptic terminals, and acts there to strengthen the synaptic connections by enhancing transmitter release from the presynaptic terminal. If you get one tail shock, you get a transient enhancement of transmitter release that lasts for minutes. This does not require new protein synthesis. But if you get five training trials, you get a persistent enhancement of synaptic transmission that lasts for days, and this does require new protein synthesis. Now, the modulatory pathways produce changes at other points within the neural circuit. But I want to focus on this one for several reasons. One is that this is an important locus which mediates a significant part of the memory storage, number one. Number two, it has a representation of both the short-term and long-term memory. In fact, one of the interesting things that has emerged from this study that again is proven to be quite general is that the same synapse can mediate both short and long-term memory. And finally, we were able to find with Sam Schacker that you can reconstitute this component of the neural circuit in dissociated cell culture. You can take a single sensory neuron, a single motor neuron, and a single serotonergic cell, put it in culture. They form perfectly good connections with one another. You don't even need the serotonergic cell. You know it releases serotonin. You can just puff on serotonin. So if you puff on serotonin once, you get a transient enhancement that lasts for minutes. This does not require new protein synthesis. If you puff on serotonin in this connection five times, you get a more persistent enhancement that lasts for several days. This does require new protein synthesis. So I want to look with you at the conversion of short-term to long-term because this illustrates in paradigmatic form what we want to understand. How do you set up the short-term process, and how do you convert it to the long-term process? I want to simply to emphasize to you, in order to connect this with what Ovid and Paul talked about, we are looking here at rapid synaptic transmission, glutamate mediated between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons and the motor neurons in the gill. On the other hand, the serotonergic pathways, I will show you in a moment, produce a slow synaptic action which modulates this rapid synaptic action. So we're going to look at a blow up of the connections between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron in order to consider how the short-term process is set up and how it's converted to the long-term process. <laughs> 
This is the sensory neuron, this is the motor neuron, this is the tail, and I'm only showing you the case of the serotonergic facilitators, but the others work the same way. The serotonergic facilitators engage a seven transmembrane spanning receptor, which on activation activates an adenyl cyclase, which increases the level of cyclic AMP in the sensory neurons. And as Paul pointed out to you, the cyclic AMP uh, level acts, the increasing cyclic AMP acts for the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. And this is a very interesting enzyme that has two regulatory subunits, these spindle-shaped st uh, structures, and two catalytic sub uh, uh, subunits, the oval-shaped structures. The regulatory subunits normally inhibit the catalytic subunit, a point I want to come back to in a moment. When the level of cyclic AMP rises, the regulatory subunit binds the cyclic AMP, undergoes a conformational change, frees the catalytic subunit, and the catalytic subunit phosphorylates substrates in the cytoplasm, ion channels, and the machinery for exocytotic release of transmitter, and leads to a trans enhancement of transmitter release, glutamate release from the presynaptic terminal. Together with Vincent Castellucci, we were able to show that if you just inject cyclic AMP, you could simulate this. In a very nice series of experiments with Paul and Angus Nair, we showed that cyclic AMP produces all of its action through the catalytic subunit. If you inject the catalytic subunit by itself, you simulate the short-term process. With a transient increase in cyclic AMP, as you see with one tail shock or one pulse of serotonin, the level of cyclic AMP rises only transiently, and only a small amount of the catalytic subunit translocates from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. But with Roger Tsien, we were able to show that if you give repeated training, five pulses of serotonin, the regulatory subunit stays off the catalytic subunit for a longer period of time because, as Jimmy Schwartz showed, the cyclic AMP level rises for a longer period of time. And that allows the catalytic subunit to translocate to the nucleus, and in so doing, it also recruits the MAP kinase. And this is the first time we got any insight into why repeated training is necessary for long-term memory. One of the reasons it's necessary, it allows the translocation to the nucleus of the appropriate kinases necessary to set up the long-term process. The setting up of the long-term process involves three steps, an initiation step, a consolidation step, and a stabilization step. And I want to say a word about each of them. The initiation step is an extremely interesting and nuanced step because it turns out that what you need to do when you translocate to the nucleus is not only activate an activator of transcription, you have to remove a repressor. In order to trigger the long-term process, you have to activate a transcription factor called CREB1, cyclic AMP response element binding protein, because it binds to a sequence in DNA called the CRE, the cyclic AMP response element. But the, but the cyclic AMP response element binding protein, CREB, is normally inhibited by a repressor, CREB2. And in order to activate the activator, you have to get rid of the repressor. And this is the first time we realized that there are, in fact, inhibitory constraints on long-term memory. When you think of how difficult it is to put information in long-term memory, you realize the actual elements in opposition to you putting information into long-term memory. You, the ease with which you put things into long-term not only varies from period to period, but really varies from time to time during the course of the day. And we think that one of the reasons this is so is there are a number of inhibitory constraints in which I'm just showing you the first. If you remove this inhibitory constraint, you have both in aplysia and in flies, where this has been looked at, flash bulb memories, where a single training trial will immediately give you a long-term memory. This really has a lot of significance because it explains to you why you can forget things so easily, why you don't put it in the long term. And it also tells you, you know, why some people remember things so well. I have a friend, Steve Siegelbaum. Siegelbaum remembers everything. Uh, I used to think he was just a bright kid at Columbia. And now I'm beginning to worry that he might be a mutant. He might, <laughs> he might have a specific defect in Crab 2 that allows him to put these things into long-term memory so readily. Once you free CREB1 of its inhibitory constraints, you activate a number of immediate response genes, of which I'm only, uh, only going to focus on two, ubiquitin hydrolase and CBP. First, ubiquitin hydrolase. 
Jimmy Schwartz first showed that ubiquitin hydrolase binds to the ubiquitin proteasome and leads to the cleavage of the regulatory subunit, which he shows establishes persistent kinase activity. So the ubiquitin proteolysis cleaves the regulatory subunit and removes a second inhibitory constraint. It now frees the catalytic subunit and allows it to phosphorylate substrates in the cytoplasm, but now without requiring any signaling, it does no longer require either serotonin or cyclic AMP. So this is, if you will, the simplest case of either serotonin or cyclic AMP. So this is, if you will, the simplest case of long-term memory. Excuse me. You activate in a transcriptionally dependent fashion a second messenger kinase is activated by the short-term process. Keep it going now for long-term process without requiring any further signaling. We have found this carries the memory for the first 10 to 12 hours. What gives the memory its persistence is the fact that CBP acting by itself and together with another transcription factor I'm not going to describe for you gives rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. A typical sensory neuron has in the basal state about 1,200 synaptic connections. After long-term sensitization training, Craig Bailey showed it goes to about 26 to 2,800 synaptic connections. So if you leave this beautiful amphitheater remembering anything from what Paul Ovitz told you, it is because you will leave here with a somewhat different brain that you walked into this room with, and that's because anatomical changes have occurred in your brain you will leave here with a somewhat different brain that you walked into this room with, and that's because anatomical changes have occurred in your brain. This general sequence, this, this general sequence, this core signaling sequence has turned out to have a certain generality. Uh, almost identical sequence of steps have been delineated independently in Drosophila using a completely different approach based on genes and behavioral analysis. And initial analysis from the honeybee suggests that a similar kind of process is present there. But if you think about it, the finding that a transcriptional mechanism is involved in long term solves one problem for you, but it poses another. It solves the problem because it gives you the initial insight as to why generally new protein synthesis is necessary for long term but not short term memory. New protein synthesis in interfering with new protein synthesis blocks the expression of these immediate response genes. But it poses a very deep and fascinating problem in the cell biology of memory that I want you to think about for a moment. Having a transcriptional mechanism for long term means that now there's ready communication between the nucleus and the synapse. What does that mean? Does that mean the unit for long-term information storage is, in fact, the whole neuron and not the single cell? This is not an academic question because, simply to remind you, as Paul pointed out, a single cell in the central nervous system of vertebrates makes not one but a thousand connections. And a lot of those connections can be on different target cells. So the question comes up, having a transcriptional mechanism can one reconcile that with synapse restriction, as one has in the short term, where individual synapses can be regulated? Or does the long-term process commit each neuron to responding as a whole, so every single synaptic connection is modulated in the same way? To address that question, Kelsey Martin in the lab worked on a new culture system. Rather than culturing a single sensory neuron with a single motor neuron, she took bifurcated sensory neurons and cultured them with two symmetrical motor neurons. Now you could puff on serotonin on one set of, uh, of terminals without in any way affecting the cell body or the other set of terminals. And we found that if you applied a single pulse of serotonin, you produced a transient facilitation at this set of terminals, synapse restricted, that lasted for minutes and did not require uh, new protein synthesis. There was no facilitation here. If you now applied five pulses of serotonin, you produced a persistent facilitation that lasted for days, but that again was synapse restricted. There was no facilitation here. This facilitation was associated with an increase in number of synaptic varicosities with growth of new synaptic connections. There was a doubling in the number of synaptic connections, and it required transcription. It involved CREB-mediated transcription. You could block it by injecting anti uh, antibody into the sensory neuron cell body. 
So this raised the question, how does this come about? Clearly, the five pulses are somehow sending a signal back to the nucleus to activate Krebs. Are the proteins then selectively targeted to only this set of terminals to give you synapse restriction? Or are proteins sent to both sets of terminals, but only those terminals that have been marked in some way can utilize those proteins productively to give rise to the growth of new synaptic connections? So we tested the second hypothesis, whether a marking signal is necessary in order to capture the proteins. And we thought that perhaps one or two pulses of serotonin might be adequate to do this. So we tested again in a minimalist way, applying just a single pulse of serotonin in the experiments that's illustrated on the next slide. So if you apply five pulses of serotonin to one set of terminals, you produce a synapse-specific facilitation that lasts for days. This is 72 hours, associated with a doubling of synaptic connections and Krebs mediated. If you apply a single pulse of serotonin to the other branch, just before or just after, there's a restricted time window. You, before or after you give the five pulses, you can capture the long-term process for the other set of synaptic connections. This is about half the amplitude. And instead of having a doubling, you have a 30 to 40% increase in uh, number of synapses. But it has exactly the same time course. So this was really a fascinating result. Because it indicated that the short-term process has really two very different functions, acting by itself and acting in conjunction with a long-term process. Acting by itself, it produces a short-term synaptic facilitation that contributes to short-term memory storage. But acting in conjunction with a long-term process in any part of the synaptic tree, it marks that synapse so it can utilize proteins coming down from all terminals in a way so it can give rise to a new synaptic terminal which other parts of the neuron which do not receive this marking signal cannot do. They cannot use those proteins in such a productive way. So this obviously has raised the question, what is the nature of the marking signal? And we have spent really a lot of time analyzing that recently. And I will simply outline to you our results. We have found there are two components to the marking signal. One is covalent modification, serotonin activating cyclic game P and PK mediating that covalent mark. That captures the signal and allows you to set up the long-term facilitation. But interestingly, we found that to stabilize that mark requires local protein synthesis. And I want to remind you, and one of the reasons I drew this dendritic spine here is to remind you that input into neurons, as Paul early ind indicated, comes onto dendritic spines. And we have known for years that dendritic spines have in them the machinery for local protein synthesis. They have ribosomes, they have messenger RNAs, and they synthesize proteins. But there's been no idea whatsoever of what the function of that local protein synthesis is. We've now pro provided direct evidence that one of the functions of local protein synthesis is to stabilize the mark so that the growth of synaptic connections persists. If you inhibit protein synthesis locally, the processes grow out, but they retract after about 24 to 36 hours. We've now dissected out isolated processes of the sensory neurons, generated cDNA libraries from just that process. So for the first time, we have all the messages in that compartment. We've sequenced those sequences. And we found a very interesting feature that I just want to emphasize for one second. We found that a number of those messages have a special mechanism for translation, which is sensitive to the inhibitor rapamycin. These are messages that have been shown in other contexts to be recruited for growth. And if you use rapamycin, you in fact block this protein synthesis dependent component of stabilization. So not only do we have some ins insight into the importance of local protein synthesis in the stabilization of the mark, but we've shown that there's a specific subcategory of translational mechanism that is particularly important. Now, the ability to mark synapses on the one hand and to activate transcription on the other really sets up a new mechanism of signaling within neurons, long-range signaling, which has significant implications for the integrative action of the neuron. But I've considered with you only the simplest case. I've shown you that facilitatory input 
can set up synapse-specific facilitation, and that can be captured. But clearly, you want to make sure that you don't simply grow additional connections. You want to be able to prune them in some ways. So you want to know what happens to inhibition. Can inhibition also be synapse-specific? Can it be captured? Can it prune connections that have been enhanced by facilitatory input? Well, a number of years ago, Jimmy Schwartz, Steve Siegelbaum, and I found that the peptide famaphomide related to encephalin working through arachidonic acid can produce the mirror image process to serotonin. It can produce presynaptic inhibition, decreasing transmitter release. And we've shown that with repeated pulses, famaphomide can produce long-term presynaptic inhibition, that this is associated with a retraction of synaptic connections. More recently, we've shown that this can be synapse-specific, you can get it at one synapse and not the other if you give five pulses of serotonin, but you can capture it if you give a single pulse of famaphomide to the other branch. This, of course, raised the question, how is this mediated transcriptionally? Is this also mediated by CREB1, or does this is involve other tra uh, transcriptional mechanism? And so we explored this in the following way. We first applied in one uh, set of cultures five pulses of serotonin to produce synapse-specific facilitation. And we showed we could block that with CREB1. We then gave five pulses of famaphomide, and we produced synapse-specific inhibition. This was not blocked by CREB1, but this was blocked by specific antibody to CREB2. So this was a fascinating result, because I told you earlier that we had demonstrated that CREB2 is a repressor of CREB1. And with these experiments and others that we've carried out, we've shown that CREB2 has a second function. It can also mediate transcriptional activation, and specifically can meet transcriptional activation that participates in long-term presynaptic facilitation. So here we had a situation in which CREB2 mediates two functions. It acts as a repressor of CREB1, and it acts as a transcriptional activator of its own, important for presynaptic inhibition. And this raises the fascinating question, what happens if you interact facilitation and inhibition in the same neuron. What happens if you give five pulses of serotonin here and five pulses of famaphomide here? Will they balance each other out? Will CREB1 will win out or will CREB2 win out? So we carried out the experiments in the following way. We first showed that if you apply five pulses of famaphomide to one set of synapses, you get synapse-specific inhibition, nothing at the other branch. In another set of cultures, you give five pulses of serotonin to one branch, you get synapse-specific facilitation at that branch and not at the other. But if you now do the competition experiment, you give five pulses of serotonin to one branch and five pulses of famaphomide to the other branch, you find that the inhibition is completely expressed, normally expressed, but that the facilitation is completely obliterated. This is a completely new kind of logic for synaptic integration. Simply to remind you, short-term synaptic integration, the way it's classically described in the textbooks, like those written by Schwartz and Jessel, <laughs> describe synaptic inhibition and synaptic excitation as equals competing with one another. And in fact, in the short-term process, if you give single pulses of famaphomide and serotonin, a single pulse of serotonin gives you perfectly good expression of the facilitation, and famaphomide to the other branch gives you perfectly good expression of inhibition. But in the long term, the CREB mediated repression, the CREB2 mediated repression, dominates and completely overrules the synapse specificity. So it acts as if you even hadn't applied any serotonin at all. So in this particular case, the logic of the neural network is not determined by the history of usage of the synapse. It is determined by the logic of the transcriptional factors. And I think simply summarize that for you here, that when one deals with nuclear-mediated integration, one is dependent not only on the history of the synapse, but also on the logic of the transcriptional circuitry that you've established. So when you interact serotonin and famaphomide, you really have the logic of CREB2 determining the system. And I think this is really quite likely to have great practical importance because it can really explain why the consolidation of long-term memories can so easily be disrupted by stimuli that interrupt your thinking or disturb you in some way that can activate inhibitory pathways and shut off 
the ability of the excitatory synapse to really store, uh, store long-term memory. So, so far I've indicated to you that using a reductionist approach in a very simple animal, one has been able to delineate a behavior that can be modified by learning, characterize the neural circuitry, pinpoint an important site that is modified by learning, show how that site mediates both short and long-term memory, and define a signaling sequence that contributes importantly both to the short-term and the long-term process. But it raises the final point that I want to consider with you, and that is how general is this process? I've so far indicated to you the simplest case we could consider of learning and memory. This is a form that is called implicit or procedural learning and memory, and it refers to essentially the modification of reflex behavior, of improvements in perceptual and motor skills. This you find in invertebrates as well as vertebrates. It does not involve consciousness for recall. It is really an enhancement of reflex behavior. And it, as I've shown you and has been shown now in a number of cases, this vol involves alterations of synaptic strength within the reflex circuit itself that mediates the behavior. There is no learning system superimposed in it. The learning occurs within the system itself by modulatory input. But the memories we hold most near and dear are called explicit or declarative. They involve conscious recall, conscious recall of facts of events, information about people, places, and objects. And this requires a special structure in the brain called the medial temporal lobe and a region deep to it called the hippocampus. And about 10 years ago, when I reached my 60th birthday, I screwed up my courage and together with a number of colleagues, particularly uh, Mark Mayford and Seth Grant, returned to the hippocampus. One of the, stimulus, one of the stimuli for returning to the hippocampus was the fact that uh, Kapecki and Smythes had developed techniques for knocking out individual genes in mice. And it became clear that mice are terrific genetic systems for looking at the roles of how individual genes affect synaptic transmission on the one hand and behavioral performance on the other. Uh, so we began to try to use both a pharmacological and a genetic approach uh, to mice, focusing specifically on spatial memory mediated importantly by the hippocampus. Now we already knew at that time that as a result of the work of Per Anderson and many of his students, one had delineated within the hippocampus uh, a mechanism of, of enhancing synaptic strength called long-term potentiation, which bore some similarity to the facilitation we had encountered in aplysia. There are three major synaptic pathways in the hippocampus. I will focus only on one called the Schaefer collateral pathway because it's been well studied and it's very important clinically. One has shown that lesions of this pathway give rise to important memory disturbances in humans. Now, earlier work had shown that if you give a train of stimuli brrr, like that to one of these pathways, Schaefer collateral pathways, you produce an enhancement of synaptic strength in slices that last for a couple of hours. An analysis of that showed that this was a covalent modification mediated by kinase called cam kinase, different one encountered in, in aplysia, but the logic was the same, a covalent modification of pre-existing proteins. But we had found in aplysia that there was a big difference between one training trial and repeated training trials. There was a representation on the cellular level of long-term memory. So we wanted to see what happens when you used repeated trains. And we found that when you used four repeated trains, you produced a new phase, a late phase of LTP, that had very different prop properties. It required cyclic gain P. It required the cyclic gain P-dependent protein kinase, MAP kinase, and it required transcription and translation. So the next slide just gives you a, an outline of current thinking of how LTP is, uh, is set up. Schaefer collateral pathways, if you activate them, they release glutamate, like in aplysia, activate a receptor called the NMDA receptor that activates, that allows calcium to come in, activates an enzyme calcium calmodulin, which uh, activates calcium calmodulin-dependent kinase, which phosphorylates substrates in the cytoplasm and gives rise to short-term synaptic enhancement. But with repeated trains, the amount of calcium coming in also activates an adenyl cyclase, which activates the cyclic game P-dependent protein kinase, MAP kinase, leading to Krebs phosphorylation 
and the activation of downstream genes that are thought, and now the evidence is increasingly good, give rise to the growth of new synaptic connections. Now, initially, other people in our cells worked on this primarily pharmacologically, but we, of course, were interested in seeing whether we could bring a genetic approach to bear upon this. And I simply want to show you one set of genetic experiments, the attempt to separate the late phase from the early phase using a genetically modified mice. And particularly, we wanted to see what happens if you compromise the cyclic AMP signaling pathway. And we expressed in the mouse in a way that was restricted to the forebrain and to the hippocampus, an inhibitory constraint on the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, a regulatory subunit that inhibited the catalytic subunit but did not recognize cyclic AMP. This simply shows you the construct. We used a CAM kinase promoter to restrict the expression to the forebrain. This compares two lines of mutant mice with one line of wild-type mice. And you see, with one train of LTP, LTP is perfectly normal. There's no difference between mutant and white type. But if you use four trains, this is the mutant and this is the wild type. You see a selective defect in the late phase of LTP. So here we had something which was really very nice. We had an animal that had a perfectly normal early phase and a selectively compromised late phase. And we could ask, do these animals learn well? Do they retain short-term memory? And what about their long-term memory? We looked at this in a number of different tasks, and we found selective defects in long-term memory in all the tasks we looked at. But the nicest one that lies the cleanest temporal separation is a task called contextual conditioning, a form of learned fear, but much more complicated than sensitization. If you put a mouse into a closed container, like a Skinner box, it walks around and becomes familiar with the space. You then can sound a tone and electrify the grid and shock the animal. And it now learns a number of things, most specifically learns that this space is bad news. Anytime you put it in this space, it will anticipate the shock and it will freeze. If you put it in another space, it will not freeze. And then you can see how long does it remember to freeze. One hour short-term memory or 24 hours long-term memory. <clears throat> And you can see that these animals, this is mutant and this is wild type, learn perfectly well. They have a perfectly good short-term memory, consistent with the fact that the early phase of LTP is normal, but the late phase of LTP is selectively compromised. This is exactly what you see when you inhibit protein synthesis. So protein synthesis inhibitors interfere with the same step that PKA leads to, the turning on of transcription. And this, of course, raises the question, why does the animal not learn this task? What is wrong with its ability to recognize this space? And it dawned on us that maybe what is happening is that this animal no longer has a memory for the cognitive map of space because you've interfered with LTP and with spatial memory storage. In the early 1970s, uh, O'Keefe in London first pointed out that the very cells that participate in LTP also generate a cognitive map of space. They have an internal representation of the space they move around with. Just like you have a map in your head, so the mouse has a map in their head of their space. Individual cells will code for different positions in that space. So if an animal walks around and you record from cells in the hippocampus and take a picture of its movements, you can now take a top-down view of that, and this is illustrated here in the pseudocolor images recording from three cells simultaneously. The yellow pseudocolor indicates the animal is moving around, but the cell is not firing. So this cell fires at 6 o'clock, this at 12 o'clock, and this cell fires here. So in this way, if you record from lots of cells, you see that the animal has, in fact, formed a three-dimensional map, a two-dimensional map of that space. You can ask now, how stable is that map? In the wild-type animal, it forms that map in about 10 to 15 minutes, and the map is stable. You can take it in and out, and the map will retain itself. What happens with the mutant mouse? So we recorded from these cells. I want to show you two examples here. In the wild-type, the animal forms the fields perfectly well. You take it out, you put it back. Uh, an hour later, the map is perfectly well retained. You take it out, you put it back 24 hours, the map is retained. If you take the mutant mice, you see that they form a perfectly good map. If you take them out and put them back an hour later, short term, the map is really quite good. 
But if you take them out and put them back 24 hours later, you see that each of these fields has rotated. You can quantitate this in a blind way, and you can show that although in the mutant animal the map forms, it has a perfectly good short-term memory in space, the cognitive map is interfered with in the long term, exactly as you see with inhibitors of protein synthesis. So although this is really the beginning, we're now for the first time looking at a cognitive process, the kind that in you and me would involve conscious participation, and we're seeing how synaptic plasticity interferes with memory storage because it interferes with the stable maintenance of this cognitive map in space. So let me conclude by just making two general points. I have indicated that studies of implicit and explicit memory storage indicate that there is a conserved logic to signaling involved in memory storage on both the cellular and molecular level. On the cellular level, in both implicit and explicit memory storage, and evolutionarily ranging from a plesia to mice, short-term memory is, is stored as transient changes in synaptic strength, and long-term memory is stored by persistent changes in synaptic strength and the growth of new synaptic connections. On the molecular level, short-term memory involves, in every case that has been looked at, covalent modifications of pre-existing proteins leading to the strengthening of pre-existing synaptic connections. And long-term memory involves recruitment of transcription and the growth of new synaptic connections. In its molecular detail, short-term memory recruits a number of different signaling systems, suggesting that different learning processes can recruit different second messenger cascades. But surprisingly, the transition from short to long term and the initiation of the long term process is amazingly conserved and involves now in a large number of memory processes, PKA, MAP kinase, phosphorylation of CREB, the induction of immediate response genes, and the growth of new synaptic connections. The fact that this switch is so conserved has some clinical relevance. To begin with, a number of disorders of memory including age-related memory loss. That is not Alzheimer's disease, but the normal of weakening of age of memory that occurs with age commonly involves converting of new information from short-term to long-term. And in mice, we've been able to demonstrate that, in fact, this involves a selective defect in the PKA system and its ability to, to initiate the transcriptional cascade. And since this is modulated by dopamine, we've been able to show we can reverse the physiological deficit and reverse the behavioral deficit in mice by using either D1 agonists or inhibiting the cyclic game p phosphodiesterase using Rolopran. So if you're a mouse, we can really help you with the age-related memory loss. <laughs> For people, we're not at all sure as yet. But in a larger sense, not only have we been able to use molecular biology to learn something about the nature of memory storage, but also, as one had hoped at the very beginning, the study of learning and memory has given us, I think, new insights into biological aspects of signaling within the nervous system. And I just want to use two or three examples to conclude. And that is, for example, we have learned that one of the functions of modulatory transmitters of the kind that Paul and Abbott talked about are recruit is that they're recruited by learning processes as reinforcing stimuli. And the reason they're used as reinforcing stimuli is because they can initiate signaling through second messenger cascades of the kind that Paul has delineated. They can translocate to the nucleus, activate genes to give rise to, uh, uh, to the growth of new synaptic connections. One and two, they can mark synapses so that those proteins can be used productively. But most interestingly, I think the work on learning has shown that there is ready and easy communication, an intimate dialogue, if you will, between the synapse and the nucleus and the nucleus and synapses, as a result of which 
Synaptic transmission needs to be importantly governed, or is importantly governed, by the logic of the transcriptional machinery itself. And I've shown you, when facilitation and inhibition interact, it is the logic of the transcriptional machinery that wins out in the case of uh, facilitation. So when I began my research 40 years ago, uh, I had hoped that a reductionist approach in a simple system would give us some initial insight into learning and memory storage. And that was clearly a leap of faith, but a leap for which I've been rewarded beyond my fondest dreams. Uh, but clearly, explicit memory storage is an enormously deep problem, and we are really just at the beginning. We're beginning to understand aspects of the storage mechanism, but we know very little about the system's properties of memory. How storage mechanism at one side of the hippocampus communicates with storage mechanisms at other sites, how the hippocampus communicates with the neocortex. But not to worry. I think that there is every reason to believe that these questions will be avidly explored in the years ahead. Uh, because the problems of biology of the mind, in fact, neuroscience in general, have captured the imagination of the scientific community of this century, this 21st century, in the way the biology of the gene has captured the imagination of the biological community at the end of the last century. Uh, young people increasingly are moving into neurobiology because they find problems of neurobiology of the mind so extraordinarily interesting. In that spirit, I really believe that the three of us whom you honor here today represent, if you will, the early messengers on mind brain to Stockholm. As the biological study of mind comes to assume its central role within medicine and within biology, I fully expect that you will continue to call to Stockholm and honor as graciously as you've honored us a whole succession of brain scientists and recognize them for their own leaps of faith. Thank you very much.